Hey, y'all, you want to set your child up for success? Is your child struggling with a specific subject or need help with the subject? Is your child ahead, not getting challenged enough in class? Well, IXL Learning is an online learning program that enriches your homeschool curriculum. It offers practice in math, English, language arts, science, and social studies while adapting to each child, meeting them where they are. Plus, IXL encourages students to become curious and empowers them to choose how to learn. Look, we homeschool our son. No doubt about it. He's more of a visual learner, and we use IXL, and Cindy teaches him, and there are so many different benefits to the program. It adapts to exactly what he needs in different areas. So IXL is the perfect supplement to your homeschool curriculum. IXL offers interactive practice problems, educational games, lessons, and video tutorials for every topic you're teaching at home. It's easy to use, time-saving. Everything on IXL is organized by grade, subject, topic, and subtopic, making it simple to find activities for the exact skills you are covering. IXL offers instant feedback and explanations of new topics as kids use the program. Kids can explore any topic in any grade level. They aren't forced into a single learning path like they are on other programs. If you're homeschooling your child because they were falling behind or because they were too far ahead like our son, IXL is a great program to help them get the exact support they need. Kids love IXL's positive feedback awards and educational games. IXL is trusted by 15 million students worldwide and has proven to improve performance in over 75 scientific research studies. Make an impact on your child's learning. Get IXL now. And Real Life Real Crime listeners can get an exclusive 20% off IXL membership when they sign up today at IXL.com slash today. Visit IXL.com slash today to get the most effective learning program out there at the best price. And don't forget, Real Life Real Crime listeners get 20% off. Y'all, we really do use this product, and it's been a godsend. Every day when you log into ChumbaCasino.com, the ultimate online social casino, you get a free daily bonus. Imagine if you got daily bonuses in other parts of your life. I chose French fries over loaded French fries. I asked Stuart from accounting about his weekend, even though I don't care. I updated my operating system without having to call tech support. Collect your free daily bonus at ChumbaCasino.com now. And live the Chumba life. VGW Group. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney prior to and during questioning. If you can't afford one, the court will point one for you. You understand your rights? Warning, each episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast, will contain descriptions of acts of violence or of a sexual nature and are for people that are 18 years or older. Heed my warning, people. I do not get the facts of these cases off the internet or from some television show. These facts are I'm retelling were presented to me by the victims of the crime or the perpetrators who committed the crimes. My descriptions of the crime scenes are what I saw with my own two eyes. If you are going to get offended, turn this podcast off now. Thank you. Police. 
Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Woody Overton, and, and Jim, the Hitman Rathman, Jim, is what he likes to call Rathman. me. Y'all, um, we're on the private patron page, that do, so y'all can have some more access, uh, you know, bonus content for your patron members, because we couldn't have run this investigation without you. But everybody else, you'll get to hear this tonight when it drops. And we are in person together, mm-hmm, which, which, I is, like, which is it, nice. It is always nice. Right? A lot more of that to come in the future. Though. Right. That's right. We're just getting started, baby. But the, um, turn that off. <laughs> the, so y'all were, you know, we're unscripted. We're raw. How can they be posting on there? They shouldn't, they shouldn't be able to post. I don't think so. Hey, are y'all on the, uh, Michelle, y'all on the patron page? Are we on the right page? I guess so. You hit, you hit mm-hmm. the link. Okay. All right. So anyway, I guess people can make a uh, post on it. It doesn't matter. Uh, you're all good. patron members, but the everybody, um, we're doing a hotline episode means where we're going to answer your questions to the best of our ability on Courtney's case. Um, and there's a lot of them. So, but well, we can't answer hundreds. Yeah. We can't answer everything naturally because of the sensitivity of the investigation. Jim, what do we want to say about where we're at now? Um, what do you think we can um, say? What I'll say is that we've gotten some very good information that we've been working around the clock on. Uh, so when we said it was hot uh, a few weeks ago, um, it's a full inferno at this point. It's nuclear. Um, yeah. But we're just going to keep pressing on because there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of ground to cover. Still a lot of following up to do as well. Um, I probably could work straight through for the next 72 hours on everything that I have without sleep. And I still don't think I would be caught up with it. Uh, but that's okay because that's what it takes. And we're dedicated and that's what we do. Yeah, let me tell but you. But it's hot. Let me tell you the – give you an example. Um, Jim and I and well, now Detective Bradley are calling each other at all hours of the night. Um, Jim was actually – talking to a person or has been well, many people, right? Many. Coming in off the tip line, right? Many. So we're talking to many different people, but I'll just preface it with this, how investigations roll in their fluid real time. The, uh, he calls me the other night. I just gotten home, hadn't been home in forever. Thought I was going to get to spend the night at home with my wife and kids. Yep. And Jim calls me. Love you, Cindy, but no. <laughs> Jim calls at like six something. My wife is just cooking dinner and she comes in the room. She heard me on the phone and she looked at me. And she said, you got to go. Huh? I said, yep. So I loaded up and went back to Alexandria in the middle of the night to get some juice. And I mean, it's y'all. Yeah, it's the way it goes sometimes though. Um, you don't know when certain information is going to come in or when you're going to find it, but when you have it, you got to jump on it. It's not something you can wait because you may not get that opportunity again. So luckily Woody being as uh, awesome as he is had no problem, um, taking off and doing what he had to do. And he Shit. ended up pulling an all nighter because of it. That's so. right. That's right. We all ended up pulling. An <laughs> he was cross eyed by the next night, but yeah, you know, hey, real. it's the, the way it went. But here's the deal as far as the investigation goes. I don't want to say too much um, because we're at a really, really critical point right now, but I'm telling you 1,000%. It is nuclear. It is oh, yeah. on fire. You bad guys and girls. Sugar it, is fixing to turn yeah, your shit. Sugar is turning to shit. Or you're, you're fucked. Pardon my French, but you're fucked. And we're coming for you. And you're going to know it real soon. So we, we, we can't say much more other than that. No, other it's, than, it's still it's still got a lot of groundwork to do, uh, but it's moving in the right direction. A lot of groundwork to do. Mm-hmm. You know who you are, and we know who you are, and we're coming. But when we come, we're going to come correct, and you're not going to be able to get out of it. So nope. that's, that's it. But that, by no means, lifers. Uh, do not stop calling in your tips. 
No, I still need more info. Everything else, you can never have too much info. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We still have to follow our other leads down, no matter what they are, and they come in. I was following them up since six this morning. Uh, got here and I was, I was on the phone the entire drive, just, uh, returning phone calls and getting new leads and new information and connecting dots. So that's what we do. We cross T's, we dot I's and we make sure our stuff is airtight. Right. And let me tell you this. If, if there were arrests made today in this case, we still wouldn't stop. Mm -mm. Okay. No matter if, if arrests get made right now, we're still not going to stop. We're not going to get off of it until we see it through. That's period. right. Period. And then by see it through, I mean, some bitch standing in court, uh, and we get a Listen, guilty party. We have one question on here. Should start off with this one. Okay. It's Go from ahead. Marlene. Good. So it's the question is, is what led each of you to your careers in law enforcement? All right. I always wanted to be a cop and I never wanted to be anything else. And, um, dreamed of it, I guess, since I was a little boy. So, yeah, I'm an adrenaline junkie. Um, yeah. so for me, when I got an opportunity, one, I love helping people, but then when you can go from completely calm and quiet and then all of a sudden you're just adrenaline is through the roof because the situation just got really hot. Um, I get addicted to those kind of things. I also get addicted to investigations and the high that comes with it. So, uh, I just, I love that. It just gives me that adrenaline. It makes me feel good knowing I'm, I'm, um, helping somebody out and I'm working really hard to make it happen, but I'm getting that adrenaline spike all at the same time. So it's kind of a perfect recipe for me. Uh, but I love it. I wouldn't want to do anything else. Well, yeah. Part of me wanting to be a cop is I didn't want to sit behind the same desk every day no. and do the same, punch the same clock, do the mm-hmm. same thing over and over again. And law enforcement is the greatest show on earth. So many days when I get off in the morning, I feel like I should have to pay them for getting to work there. And the, the old saying, uh, famous saying is, what is it? Those who, men who have hunted armed men long enough soon care for little else. And I, I, I paraphrase for Ernest Hemingway. Uh, um, so look at you, 28. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Sarah, I did see your question come across about um, how to be found on Pandora. We'll have somebody send you that information. We'll uh, PM you for that. So what I want to do, y'all, uh, if, if, um, and Jim, you can read some of those in between here, but I have a, a hundred and something questions. We had already people had submitted mm-hmm. some the lifers and, uh, and patron members. So let me read a couple of them just to start. So I'll, I'll finish these two here and these will be the last two, which is just Laura and, and Julie, uh, Laura, um, if we, well, I mean, Woody and I have an idea, uh, a really good idea, but that's nothing that we can release right now. It would be way too sensitive to do so. What's the question? Um, the question was, is do we know who did it or suspect who did it? And, you know, we can't, we just can't tell you that right now. I mean, until you confirm it, there's no way to, um, to really be able to be concrete on it but when we go that direction you all are going to know it's been 15 years and we don't want to do anything to ruin it right now um the other question was from julie which had to do with um have the police did they question everybody involved did they basically do their due diligence on their job okay well let's uh, that one's in here also so we'll okay kind of answer perfect as we go so we're going to answer the questions that have been submitted so uh and then once we get through here if y'all have some more yeah questions, absolutely we have time we'll certainly do it um, first one is Andre Davis Johnson. He says, not necessarily a question, but putting my wish out in the universe, hoping to see Woody, Jim, Detective Rabelais, and Courtney's amazing family on a panel discussing how they solved who killed Courtney Coco Crime Con in Orlando in May of 2020. I would love that. <laughs> that would be. That, you know, be a dream come true yeah, for be all of us. Period. But it, it, we're going to be at Crime Con regardless. And yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be headlining with on a panel to do that because it certainly would be worthy. And this, so many people backed up that one. Uh, Becky Andre, Amber Salad, Kimberly, uh, Cindy Grady, a bunch of people mm-hmm. uh, all say they hope that was what happens. But and so do we. Melanie Moore asked a question, Jim. Says, uh, is there someone higher up, attorney general, state rep, state rep, et cetera, that Detective Green's handling of the case can be reported to? 
Well, the everybody has somebody they have to answer mm-hmm. to eventually, uh, uh, even law enforcement members. In whether it's Detective Green or anybody else that's in official capacity, and and something is found out, which I believe dirty laundry will come out in the end of this, then they're going to have to answer to the powers that be. So it does, you know, if you're local law enforcement, you could be answering to the state police. If you're state police, you could be answering to the feds or a combination thereof. The feds have to answer to other feds. So yeah, the, uh, they're going to know whoever's dirty or bad. Mm. They're going to know and they're going to have to answer for it. So it's all going to come out in the wash. Yeah. And you can, you can bet that, the the murder is the first it's just thing. The way, it's just the way it goes. The the murder or the first thing they're going to do is flip on flip on someone else and get less of time. If it's a dirty if it's a dirty law enforcement. It's the best. Officer. It's basically the only play they have is to uh, at that point is to flip on those on others and hope you can get a lighter sentence. Okay, Elizabeth P. Chalker. She's at, awesome, by the way. Hey, Elizabeth. <laughs> she says this APD. Still have the evidence from Courtney's house, and has it been tested yet? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, the I'm going to honestly tell you that we don't know if they have the evidence yet. Uh, I'd be very shocked uh, if they do, but if they do, that'd be great. I can I can tell you for sure it hasn't been tested. Yeah. Uh, um, because it, it's a still a homicide for Chambers County Sheriff's Office out of Texas, and. We know for a fact that APD told Detective Green specifically, told Detective Rabelais, who was the lead homicide investigator on the case, that there was no evidence taken from Courtney's house. And certainly, if you don't take any evidence, you can't test it, right? So uh, none of that stuff that was taken that we provided y'all the list with before has been tested. Right. Um. And Elizabeth says, for the 4 a.m. calls made with Courtney's phone, can you t- determine who had those numbers 15 years ago? Jim, that's your department. Um, it takes some It takes some work. Uh, I need a little bit of assistance on that. There's some some information is still good and accurate with in regards to her phone, but those 4 o'clock a.m. calls, um, that's just going to you know, hopefully be a power of subpoena here soon enough then to be able to get that access. Right. To leave that or some, some serious digging. Those records don't ever go away. Uh, um, it's just it's been 15 years. Yeah. You just don't know what kind of system they had to back it up. It's not like today where you have an iCloud or you have other means of being able to back up mass amounts of storage. Um, then it was different. A lot of those records were kept. Um, maybe maybe a PDF file, and it's just stored into a massive database. Some of it's printed out. Um, we don't really know. So it just takes time to get to that. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of people back then used what's known as burner phones. Yeah, um, we'll go ahead and right. talk about that. Basically, they they'd go and buy a prepaid phone, and then whenever you um, get caught or someone's getting too close to you, it'll take the phone, you throw it out, and you go get another one. Right. Burner and unfortunately, that's awesome. what a lot of those uh, phones back then were were used for burner phones for that. Okay, so Christian D R E R U P Drup says the mom mentioned they have the names of the people who were called. Confusing why such obvious leads were never followed up on. I assume Woody and Jim are actively investigating those people now. Christian, mm-hmm. you're absolutely correct. One hundred thousand percent. We don't. We yeah. do not miss anything. We will talk to everyone. Yeah, we are allowed to have access to. Period. Right. Everything. Next question is Elizabeth again. Um, She's got a lot in there. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I skipped maybe, a couple. Of maybe you missed your call. Maybe Elizabeth country. should have been a detective too, because her questions are pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Boy. Who was at the domino party? Have they all been interviewed by Woody or Jim or any law enforcement? Mm. Well, it's very sensitive. Yeah. yeah. Very sensitive question because yeah. that's uh, one of the links to one of her last days alive. So um, her last. Hour or last alive. hours alive. Yeah. So that that's pretty sensitive to the current and ongoing investigation. So, okay. The, uh, y'all told you we'll answer them if we can. And, and, but we're not going to do anything to jeopardize the investigation. Uh, Julia 
Gaudet Spielman says, were they able to do a rape kit for DNA? I could tell you that the, they did a, what's called a SANE kit, a sexual assault. Uh, no, SANE is for the nurse. The, the rape kit, whatever the official term is for it, it was done and nothing was recovered. Okay. I, I can tell you that for a fact. Um, that's in the autopsy. So, uh, somebody, Elizabeth says, is Cedric Green originally from Alexandria area? I believe so. But I assume sure. so. Yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, huh. um, skip over a couple of so, these. Here's, here's a question from Julie James on here. I'm going to yeah. answer this real quick while you look. Um, the question is, is it also seems that or it also seems like the people who were found in their car could have been, could have given tons of info where they, interrogated so that would be a good question for detective rabelais uh he's not with us um i can actually but, answer it yeah that, go for it. um they arrested mm -hmm. the, those people in the in the car and and basically the hood or the barrio in houston and uh they had courtney's car is what we call a crack loaner and the meaning that people will go and stolen vehicles like that and to get rid of them, they'll drop them in the hood and leave the keys in the car. And that and the first person gets in, they'll take it to a drug dealer and say, you know, give me five rocks and you can have this car. Right? You can have the so, car for a week. And, and, and that is such a great way to destroy evidence, um, and get the wrong people. But the people that were arrested in the car absolutely have nothing to do with Courtney's murder other than they were found in her car. Okay. And that, that they had some time, and that car, I'm sure, passed through many hands in the mm -hmm. hood. Yep. The detective probably handled that, and he did a tremendous job with it. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe we can ask him later on to speak to that further if needed. But uh, he did a he did an outstanding job on that years ago. Yeah, yeah. Detective Ravelli's a bomb. He is pretty the, damn good. Another question from um, Spielman said it was rumored at one time that Courtney was an informant for APD. Any truth to this? Uh, if yes, th this could have led to her murder. Absolutely no truth to that. Zero, uh, Julia. She was never an informant for APD, period. Correct. Um, is it, is it a common practice for law enforcement to slander victims amongst themselves the way Green spoke to Rabelais about Courtney? And if not, what could be his reason for calling her a crackhead to Rabelais? Wow. You want this one? You want me to get it? I mean, you can start it. So, you know, a lot of times in law enforcement, we, you know, they just, they just speak to what they believe it could be or whatever. Um, I think, you know, I, I can tell you that Woody and I, we try to handle things a lot differently than that. Try to keep everything professional. Um, I don't understand why uh, he would turn around and make that comment. Um, to Detective Rabelais, maybe to, I don't know, obviously to, uh, from what we can gather at this point, it may be just to discourage him from continuing to investigate as if her life didn't matter. That's the only weird thing that I can think of just because I, that's just not how you should handle it. Um, you have a deceased person, you have a family that's suffering. And at the end of the day, you got to handle that with respect and care. Uh, regardless of history, whether somebody was or was not involved with drugs or whatever their life choices were, it doesn't really make a difference. It's still a human being. Yeah, it's still somebody's family member. It's still somebody, somebody that's loved. Crackhead, so, which isn't true, um, by the way. it wasn't true and it's disrespectful and, uh, you know, yeah, another and shame on you. Calls, but, uh, uh, been sitting in the Texas office, get a call from another mm -hmm. agency saying well, one that comes to mind. They said the um, anhydrous ammonia plant had blown up in Washington, Paris. They were stealing the ammonia for meth. And they got a plate leaving the scene, and it came back to one of our girls. And she was a frequent flyer. She was mm -hmm. a meth head when you were, but I didn't say, well, she's a meth head. Da, 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 da. I did say, yeah, uh, yeah, we know her. And, you know, what happened? They said that. And I said, okay, you yeah. know, but it, I didn't slander. Well, why? I, I don't know why the hell you do that. But, uh, the, uh, you know, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, human being. So I don't know. But um, let's see if I can read this one. 
Okay, Penny T. Smith says, okay, once Woody and Jim and Rabelais have finished their investigation and have exalted all avenues, how are you guys going to attain evidence from APD to be tested for DNA since you guys are no longer in law enforcement? Because I assume that the DNA will play a large role in solving this. Just ask them because of the chain of custody. It could not be released to y'all because you're no longer police. Am I right? And also... With another, will another agency step in to make arrests if by chance law enforcement is connected to her murder? Okay. You are a million percent correct, Penny, mm-hmm. that when we are not law, law enforcement any longer. Which and, sucks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this right now, I wish I was. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> but the, the, and so we, personally will not be getting any evidence to send to DNA labs, et cetera. But I can promise you this. Uh, when it reaches that point in the investigation, another agency will be stepping in. And I'm not telling you that it hadn't already reached that point, but when it reaches that point, another agency will be stepping in to do their due diligence. We're going to take it as far as we can take it in Certainly turn over anything to the proper authorities that to move the investigation forward. And, uh, yes, I, I would, well, I can't say yes. And I don't want to assume that another agency will step in. I can tell you this. If I'm not giving, we're not giving our information to APD. Uh, um, no, definitely if, not. If, if we're going to give it to someone, it's going to be to a higher, it's going to be to a, a higher authority, higher authority that, we know that has the money and has any, the means to be able to investigate the money, what needs the to be means, investigated, the experience, mm-hmm. the integrity. Yep. Uh, uh, so it won't be any question about somebody's trying to cover for somebody they work with or anything like that. Yeah, sure. And what they, Hey, they may, they may go back down and get APD to work with them, et cetera. Who knows? I, it didn't, but you better believe we're not putting all this work in. So somebody, uh, that doesn't know what they're doing or doesn't have the integrity to close this investigation out, uh, uh, will do it. We have enough law enforcement connections out there to where we can, we can hand deliver a package Absolutely. and, uh, feel comfortable and confident that it'll be followed up on and it'll be worked from that point on. So, uh, and we're when, not stupid. We're when not we deliver give it, it to, to uh, we, just like in our careers, mm-hmm. we're not going to deliver junk. Right? Nope. It's going to be on a silver platter. And then they, certainly that they, uh, they're going to have to, you know, accept it, follow up on things, and and do what they do. And Penny, thank you for that because I I see I told you here I will personally answer this question on Friday. So thanks, John um, Woodrow. Okay, Tina Nally Pennington says, "How did her car get to Winnie, and when and how was it found?" Mm. Well, it's a little, it's a little. Tina, Tina, somebody drove it there. Hey, ladies, are you feeling overwhelmed by hormonal changes? Well, you're definitely not alone. There are more than 1,000 hormone disruptors living in our environment right now. It's sending your food, your water, the air you breathe, the clothes you wear, your skincare products. They all mess with your hormones. Then there's the natural hormone changes. Your body goes through it, premenopause, menopause, and while it's a natural process, it doesn't mean you have to suffer through it. The good news is you don't have to suffer through it anymore because now you have Hormone Harmony, a formula made only with herbal ingredients that are shown to reduce hormonal symptoms in women of all ages. Hormone Harmony is not just a hormone support and supplement. It's become a phenomenon. Women can't stop talking about it on social media. A bottle of Hormone Harmony is sold every 24 seconds. And the biggest benefit? Well, my wife says it makes her feel like her own self again. And that's what women mention over and over in the reviews. And there are over 30,000 reviews for Hormone Harmony. And for a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use code RLRC at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use code RLRC for 15% off today. That's H-A-P-P-Y-M-A-M-M-O-T-H.com and use code RLRC. Hey, y'all. Let me tell you about Mochi. Mochi is a telehealth platform that connects patients 
seeking medication-based weight loss treatment with board-certified doctors and dietitians to help them determine the best treatment options to accomplish that goal. Mochi's program is completely virtual, meaning you can access their services anywhere in the United States and you will be meeting with their team online. You deserve doctors that listen. Mochi is dedicated to providing holistic, patient-centered care that prioritizes overall well-being with the goal of transforming how weight management is approached. Mochi Health takes a holistic approach to weight loss that includes visits with board-certified doctors, nutrition consultations, and medications delivered to your door. Science-backed medications include GLP-1s like Ozempic and generic compound versions, affordable and accessible regardless of insurance coverage. With Mochi, their dietitians work hand-in-hand with your medication to create personalized nutrition plans that fit your lifestyle. Reach your weight loss goals with science-backed, FDA-approved GLP-1 medications and support from real doctors and guidance from registered dietitians and help with making easy and sustainable changes to achieve results. Y'all have seen this. My wife has done it. My brother-in-law has done it. One of my best friends is doing it, and it really is an amazing process that works. So get started at joinmochi.com and use code RLRC to receive $40 off. That's join, J-O-I-N-M-O-C-H-I.com and use code RLRC to receive $40 off and let Mochi help change your life. <laughs> So no, we're not trying to make light of it. Uh, the perpetrator or perpetrators drove the vehicle there, and they they dumped Courtney and Winnie. And the car was found sometime later, and people were arrested in it in Houston, Texas. That's about all we can really say about that right now. And Chris Strupp says, "Yeah, where's where was the car found? It, it was found Houston. in Houston. Yeah, y'all." That information is on that uh, private patron page, and uh, we've scanned that in. So if you think, want to go uh, there and look at it, right? think Detective Rabley say Fifth Ward of Houston, yeah, which right. is pretty pretty bad area, right. or really rough, if you will. All right, uh, Sarah Craig says, "Can Louisiana Louisiana State Police or the DA take control if y'all can't get the evidence?" Absolutely, mm-hmm. and we're counting on it, right? Well, absolutely. If we, you know, once we cross T's, dot the I's, and hand deliver a nice package to them, hopefully it's enough for them to uh, be able to go from there. If that's where the direction we go at that time, right? And y'all, we're not telling you that we hadn't already done these things already. We're just telling you we can't say. So Ray N is the middle initial last name. Nikki says, "I have a comment, and I have to say it's because it is really bothering me!" Exclamation. I don't know why they are trying to make Coco out to be some drug head because all capitals, she definitely was not. The overdose assumption is pure bullshit. She was definitely not a dope head. I know that for a fact. Now, on the other hand, some of the people she chose to surround herself with during the end of her life were not good people. And yes, many of them. Sorry, somebody's beeping in. Yes. Many of them were on drugs or sold them. Coco was an amazingly sweet soul. I wish she never would have got involved with the wrong crowd. Hashtag justice for Coco. Go ahead, John. No, you don't. Hey, hey, Ray Nicky, the, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. And, and I, um, I, I know she was wrong around but- the wrong people. Um, but she was an amazing person, y'all. And, and, and she was a 19 year old girl. Yeah. I mean, she had a lot of life to live. The, you I mean, know. when I was 19, you know, yeah. I wasn't making the best decisions either. Right. And, and, uh, so that doesn't give someone a right she, to murder someone. She but was a, she's not a crackhead or, Full blown dope head or whatever. She was a daughter, a cousin, mm-hmm. uh, a niece, mm-hmm. and a friend. And she, uh, they, 
the I heard one of the family members or one of the family members told me she j- just didn't judge people. She just loved everybody she met and you know, falling in with the wrong crowd. And, and certainly- I, I think everybody in their teenage years or even in their, you know, very beginning of the early 20s, everybody at some point or another encounters the wrong crowd of people. She unfortunately was around the wrong crowd of people for a short time. But she was a beautiful 19 year old girl. And as far as the overdose thing is concerned, um, I don't know many overdoses where a body ends up across the state line. With, with, you know, it makes no sense and, at all. And, and need from the waist down with the legs. Yeah, exactly. And, and the next question is from Jessica Heron. And she says, Ray, she's answering Ray Nicky says, every time I hear the OD story, I think to myself, well, who gives a shit if she did it or didn't? It's still a homicide, according to the coroner. And Jessica Herring, you're right on time, sweetie. Mm-hmm. Right on time. It's a, it is a homicide investigation, period. You got any questions you want to read while I read this next one? Um, I don't see any on here right okay. now. I mean, if I scroll up, it would be. All right. So that Heather P-O-P-L-A-I says, Jessica, I think it, it the exact same thing, girl. I'm like, why are we even talking about it? Who cares if she was? I realized to the family and friends, it does matter because of her memory. But for the investigation, I just don't even know why it matters. Is a crackhead's life less important than anyone else's? Also, I've known some crackheads and they did not hold a job, have their own home, or host any kind of dominoes night at their house. They are more of a uh, the couch surfing type, negative bank balance, in and out of custody, etc. The story we have doesn't fit that dope head profile. I'll never believe that about her. At the end of the day, you know, toxicology screens, no toxicology screens, what if she was or was not involved towards the end of the day, the coroner determined it was a homicide, and that's exactly what it is. And that's how we're moving forward. That's it. Period. Yeah. And, and um, definitely not a crackhead. Um, Melanie Moore says all these years later, is it possible to find out where the phone was when those 4 a.m. calls were made? If the person interest reportedly had it and it pings towers in Texas or on the way to Texas, that should be significant. Melanie Moore, you're correct. Uh, I, I would like to say. 100% 100% certain that they could still go back and pull that information. If they still have the information, then yeah, we can still, we can still figure it out. We can still triangulate but it. Sometimes stuff gets lost, y'all. And while we're talking about this day, I, I know of a certain law enforcement agency, uh, that has no 911 calls, uh, I think since before 2014 because the system blew up or something. I don't know. So sometimes those things happen, but I doubt that that's, it's a major company. So, um, and then you better believe it's going to be looked at. Uh, one of the questions on here has to do with, are we, is APD helping us out at this time? <laughs> um, APD had an opportunity to speak with us already and chose not to uh, return the call. Um, Actually, so, they, they said they were going to meet. Well, they said they were going to meet. Times and, again, and they and never it, did. It kept getting delayed, and uh, we never even got a call back so, other than one text. To um, answer your question on that, nope. And, um, as far as your second question in regards to, uh, have we spoken to green? Uh, no, I haven't. I don't think he would talk to us anyway. Yeah. And honestly, at the way he's botched this investigation, I don't even want his, his name coming out of my mouth because I don't, I, I, I just, I I don't have any respect for that. I'm sorry. Say to him, I suck at life. It is what it is. I I wouldn't uh, ask him a question if he was standing in front of me. The, um, He's got nothing for him. So the, um, how old this is from Allie Blackman. How old was that friend's child? And would it be possible to talk to them and see if they remember anything? Uh, why were the check? Well, let's answer that first. The, it's possible. Allie actually had a four year old, pick out her mother's murderer out of, a, of what we call a six pack on a lineup on one of the cases. And Jim, I think you know which one I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And, and so 
But after 15 years, I don't know, but the, uh, I'm sure that'll be handled. And then second part is why was the checks being used, not looked into further? And is it possible to do so? The checks, y'all, if you don't know about it and you hadn't seen it in the patron page, we hadn't discussed it. Um, I think about a year after Courtney's murder, some checks were written off her account in Houston to pay some electricity bills. And, um, fortunately, the, Unfortunately, the electricity company just wrote it off because it's cheaper. I think it's six hundred dollars. It's cheaper to write it, write it off than to go through litigation or on the it. Bank wrote it off, and then to try to dig into it. But certainly, Detective Bradley and them looked into it, and it, nothing there. Uh, the 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 people, um, those people had nothing to do with the direct murder of Courtney. Now you remember her car was in the hood and in, in that area of Texas for you know, like a week. So, you know. all right. Um, this is a, man, I'm, I'm just going to read this cause y'all put it out there. Penny Smith says, this is not a question, just a comment. I just have to say it, excuse my language, but I want the sorry motherfucking murdering bastards <laughs> that are, are so nervous right now because they know y'all are close to the answers and they are screwed because for 15 years they've been walking around and thinking they got away with it. I hope they're shitting themselves daily waiting for the ball to drop because it is. Oh, I guarantee you they're feeling the heat. Love your <laughs> I guarantee it. Penny, love your Great statement. statement, Penny. Spot, yeah. on, spot on assessment. That's the same thing I want to say, Penny. I, I'm trying not to curse so much now, but I want them to be afraid, just like you. I want them. I want them to finally, after 15 years, be looking over their shoulder, waiting for their door to get kicked in, waiting for the cuffs to go on. That uh, I'm. Just, I guess I'm a kind of. I mean, angry. I just want retribution. And I want them to sweat, man. And um, they're not going to get away with it. Period. Tori had a good question on here. It says, on the way to Texas, would they? Would the perps had have a chance to stop for gas at some point, possibly caught on camera? Um, I would assume yes at some point, but we're talking 15 years ago. So um, the most of those back then either had a videotape. That would record or they had a digital recorder when they were first coming out, which would only um, record for probably about 15 to maybe 30 days before yeah, it re- re-recorded all. over itself. So it's an extremely small chance um, that anybody would have a tape back at that time. As far as I know, uh, there hasn't been any tapes collected. Right. So um, and, and, you know. It's about it's something drove, we would have followed up on 15 years ago if sure. we were on this case without a doubt. Sure. But and, and I drove that route, y'all, mm-hmm. the, the last week from Detective Bradley's house to Alexandra. You could probably make it on a tank of gas, but there's no way in hell there's going to be a videotape or anything after 15 years. We can't. I mean, we worked the murder and Popeyes, and the, and the cameras didn't even work. Most, yeah, and that was all, as as it happened. Right. Most most uh, convenience stores cameras even to this day don't even work and then if they do work they loop over after the longest one i've seen is 29 days and they automatically re-record over mm-hmm. it even on the digital stuff they don't, they don't have the spe- uh, space to store it penny we curse a lot too so candy Ducote <laughs> p-o-s-p-i-s-i-l candy as was the actual cause of death ever mentioned and the candy on the autopsy report, uh, Mandy DICUS backs her up and says, right. I don't think I ever heard on the podcast what the coroner stated the cause of death was. My husband Googled it and said strangulation. Can you please give more t- details about the coroner's full report? Sure. I'm going to do that. It's also on the patron page with the full autopsy is on there. Um, the, Cause of death is officially listed as a homicide, which means an illegal taking of Courtney's life. The as far as being able to give the actual determination, 
couldn't do it. The, um, it's, it's suspected it may have been asphyxiation, mm-hmm. smothering, um, the, you can, you can choke somebody to death without breaking the, the bone in the neck that's so sensitive. Her bone was not broken. Uh, so at, they were thinking that it was asphyxiation, but couldn't, couldn't prove it a hundred percent. She had been down or down. She had, the decomposition on Courtney's body was pretty advanced, uh, um, which is consistent with her being in the trunk, a hot trunk for a couple of days. And so that, of course, hinders the, the autopsy. Big Again, time. that's all on the patron page. The, um, but it's still a homicide. That's all a homicide, period. Um, and Megan Hester Miller says, I don't understand how they couldn't know for sure if it was asphyxia. Thought that was a point of doing an autopsy. I'm not a coroner, obviously, but I work in the hospital and have known results to determine if someone died from suffocation versus aspiration, et cetera. Just cu- curious because I feel totally invested. I do need to completely catch up with that last podcast. So. The difference is, though, between a hospital setting is this, and no, no just because I totally appreciate everything that you do in the hospital, believe me. Um, this body was a few days decomposed. So... Uh, when composite, when that starts happening, um, you start losing the ability to be able to find out exactly what it was that had happened. Whereas in a hospital setting, usually it's within a short time frame that they came to you, uh, or they're transported or if they had already passed, it's usually, you know, the body isn't, um, hasn't gone through that, dec- uh, the, been decomposed or anything like that. And, and, and not only that would be the only is difference. it not, uh, Courtney, it was, Several days, but the problem with that is it was made much, much worse because she was in the trunk of the car and it was still hot. Now, if it's hot outside, y'all know when you get in your car how hot it is inside the car. Well, it's much hotter than that inside of a trunk. And uh, so that's why when the text Bradley arrived on the scene and uh, he called Green and, you know, they found out she had only been missing for three days. That almost didn't fit because, and this is going to be hard for the family to hear, but I mean, it is what it is that because of the advanced state of decomposition and it, the, her body was further Along it was further advanced for three days, it, it may it may, have been it may look like a, a a week versus three days, or you know, as best analogy I could give. So it really, really screws up the evidence and the autopsy. I mean, you talk about maybe there should have been petechia hemorrhaging, right? Uh, if, for strangulation, even if the neck bone wasn't broken after that far, uh, being in the trunk and that, that kind of heat, you can't tell. Uh, um, but I mean, the, the pathologist that did it did a hell of a job. Um, but it, he can only put down what he, right. what he can see. So, I mean, he's a forensics pathologist. So, all right. So, stuff. Melissa Pomeroy, she's just, <laughs> Melissa Pomeroy wants to know on a scale from one to 10, how happy is Jim in his relationship? And I said, <laughs> I answer. I said, Melissa Pomeroy, you are so silly and trouble. One of my favorite, but one of my favorite lifers that makes me smile. And she, all she's always cutting up the, um, and she answered me and says, sometimes pressure gets a bit much. Laughter can relieve some of the stress. And you're right, sweetie. The, um, this, but she follows it up with an actual question that says, also, how does the chain of custody work? So, chain of custody so there's there's multiple ways to do this but typically um almost like we had tried to tell you guys before when you're on a scene and let's just say you go with uh, a body right and we put that body into a body bag we photograph it once you put in a body bag you zip it up you're going to use a once you arrive on the scene right and uh it's yours you take the chain of custody starts there right it starts there well you know, when you're going to document what time that body was in the bag, what time you took a photo of the seal, that it was sealed, what time that they left to go to the coroner's office, um, 
you know, everything is documented and that's kind of the chain of custody. You really don't do anything with any of the evidence without loading, documenting it. Uh, like another example would be, um, in this particular case, and I'm just going to give it because it's just a fact of life. Um, when they went to retest the blood. Okay. Um, if they got that through Texas, um, state, their crime lab, um, they would have had to have pulled out whatever files they had, whatever information they had in, re- in regards to uh, the blood work, and they would have had to fill out a form, maybe even take a picture of them actually doing it, documenting it. So let's just say there was five mLs worth of blood, and they took out two and a half mLs. So they need to document exactly how much they took out, how much is still remaining, who took it out, what time they took it out, signed it, witnessed it, and that way, you know, and that way there's you constantly have that chain of custody, you know. Then this blood went from this location to this locate to another location. That's all documented. And then it's the same way when it comes back to you. If, if let's just say blood's returned to that evidence collector, they need to do the same thing. I put it in another tube, um, whatever the case might be. That's what we mean by chain of custody. It's, it's completely documented from start to finish. And once you take a piece of evidence into your custody, whether you arrive on a scene and it's a body down and you visually are looking at it and say, okay, this is my scene. And that's your, the first link in the chain, Mm -hmm. right? And then you send it in. Uh, Let's say, let's say I arrived on a scene and worked in Jim and our partners. And this happened on cases uh, on state ground or, Mm -hmm. or, the guy won the bottle up his ass. Uh, um, <laughs> oh, the, thanks for the visual. Anyway, Jim went to those autopsies. I didn't, right? So mm. the, the when he takes it out, the body out, or they take it out at the autopsy, that's the next link in the chain. It has to be documented. Correct. And every time that piece of evidence moves from one pe- person's hands, whether it, let's say they put it in the evidence locker, that's – Evidence locker technician is the next chain of custody. So it's a chain and the, uh, the chain can't be broken without it being documented because the defense attorneys will have a field day. Absolutely. All right. Um, was the car returned here? Was the car returned here to Louisiana and who is in possession of the car now? And if no one has the car, was DNA taken from the car and preserved so that it could be tested? The car. Uh, was t- originally taken in possession and tested thoroughly at the Texas State Police Crime Lab in Houston. The Miss Stephanie, the mom, didn't want the car back, and and so after that, I mean, and, and I can't blame her, right? But the um her personal items were returned to the family in the car. I mean, I don't know if the bank took it back or they sold it. Um. I'm not sure what happened with that. It might even yeah. still be in state custody. Well, they didn't, they, I don't know what they're going to do with it all well, these years. But yeah. But it, but, so it's not back in Louisiana. It's usually at hours. some point it's released or it's crushed. It's really up to the to the family what they want to do yeah, with it. Yeah, it was a pretty new car, though. So I'm, I'm, maybe the bank got it back and sold it at auction. But that's mm-hmm. all speculation. But so um, <laughs> Devin Dalzart says, Penny T. Smith, do you write all your questions down to remember them? I have so many questions while I'm listening, but I can't remember shit now. <laughs> I get that, Devin. So, and the, uh, Penny answers her. Anyways, Penny says, no, girl, I have a million more I can't remember. I have so many, but all these questions are awesome and can't wait to get as many answers as possible because for investigative purposes, I know they will not be able to answer all of them. Correct. You're right. And thank you all for the questions. They are awesome. And, and Jolie uh, Spillman says, I feel you. I have 15 years of questions. And yeah, jo- Jolie, uh, the family does also, right? Um, Michael Ferris Guy says, can the FBI take over this case because of police negligence and because it crosses state lines? That yeah. could. They could if we took the package to them and asked them to look into it. And that's something that they wanted to do. Uh, they absolutely could if they wanted to. They're yeah. the feds. And, and we're not telling y'all that we haven't done that already. Okay. Uh, so Kelly McComber says the same thing. This is my question to cross the state lines. Um, 
seems like it's been established, et cetera. And Casey, all good, follows that up about crossing state lines. All right, so let's see. Beverly Jimison Mooney says, I'm glad I waited. Y'all are all asking the same things I was going to ask in the podcast before the first one. Woody said something about someone else being a cold case that tied into this one, possibly. Mm-hmm. They ran in the same group, et cetera. Anything become of that one? And will it help this case to be solved? That is a really good question. Really good question. Uh, Jim? So that particular case you're talking about has come up numerous times throughout this. Um, I think there's some similarities and there's some links, uh, but I, I'm going to go out and say that I, I believe that I don't think the two are actually connected. Um, but the, I can tell you this, Courtney, they were so such close friends that Courtney had her obituary, the, the other lady's obituary in mm-hmm. the trunk of her car cut out those newspapers back then right so um and they were like a month and a half uh, between the deaths and the other girl was dumped off the side it was about six weeks at at most between the two Um, and they were friends the the, we jim's had gotten information we talked to people that saw them together and uh right numerous places etc so there's always a possibility but um I think in this particular case, I I just don't think that there's an actual link. I'm not saying that 100% certainty that there isn't, but from what we've been able to gather at this point. Um, but the information that has come in on the other case has been very interesting and documented very well. And that's something that we're just, we're going to keep an eye on as yeah, well. It's, but we, we did get some know. good information on that. and Right. Um, Spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from Uncommon Goods. The busy holiday season is here, and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list, all in one spot. Gifts to spark joy, wonder, delight, and that's exactly what I want it feeling. Hey, y'all, I ordered a super cool piece. It's a candle with a sculpture of an LSU Tiger Stadium on top of it. And each officially licensed laser-cut wooden replica features up to four layers of detail, creating a bird's-eye view of a specific football field, seating section, and more. And every label includes your stadium's name, the team's logo, and school location. And it has a coconut soy vegan wax infused with sandalwood smell that creates tailgates and touchdowns scent profile, reminiscent of game day. It's invigorating like fresh-cut grass and nostalgic like smoke from a pre-game grill. And calming like the crisp autumn air of a new semester on campus. Y'all, I love it. I have it at the base of my TV, and I'm ready to watch the Tigers play on Saturday night, right? Uncommon Goods. Look, when you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. And many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the U.S., They have the most meaningful, out-of-the-ordinary gifts anywhere. They even have gifts you can personalize. From holiday hosts and hostess gifts to the coolest finds for kids, to hits for everyone from the book lovers to diehard sports fans, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone, not the same old selection you can just find anywhere. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. So to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C. That's uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limit time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Gobble. All Gobble meal kits are pre-prepped. That means less work for you and less waste in your kitchen. Their meal kits include everything you need so you can save time at the store or just skip that trip entirely. I got the box in and I had three different meals. I had a Kung Pao chicken, crispy fish tacos, and a beef boom jignon. However you say it, but let me tell you about the classic beef boom jignon. Look, it came 
with beef pot roast and a beef broth concentrate, red wine demi glaze, cremini mushrooms, ciapelloni onions, mashed potatoes, baby carrots, and rosemary thyme butter. It was so easy to make. Literally like 15 minutes it took Cindy. And let me tell you something. And all the dishes were fire. But this thing was like a taste explosion in my mouth. It's just un real. We've got to spend more time together and more time doing the things we love because everything came in this one single box right to my door. So see what a difference Gobble will make for your household. Right now, they're all for my listeners, a fantastic limited time deal. You get $120 off across four boxes plus free shipping and free cookies. And let me tell you, those cookies, I ate one that was sin-baked and it was delicious. Go to gobble.com slash real life. That's G-O-B-B-L-E dot com forward slash real life for $120 off your first four boxes. This offer is not available on the home site, so don't miss out. This is genius. It's taste explosions in your mouth like you never had. Yeah, absolutely. We will get there. <clears throat> um, next one's Ray Nick says, I wish someone could or would organize something here local in Alexandria in remembrance of Coco. The turnout, I believe, would be tremendous and might give this more coverage. Just a thought. I'm stuck in the hospital at the moment, 36 weeks pregnant with blood pressure issues, bed bound. So I have been reading all day and trying to think of ways to honor Coco and her amazing family and make sure the word gets out to locals. Woody and Jim Rappin RLC are doing fantastic work. Can't wear, can't wait to wear my pink for Coco Friday. Okay. Well, first of all, Ray, we, we certainly wish you good health and, um, with the pregnancy and everything. Right. And the, they just had a, a, a vigil for, uh, the, I think it's called the National Day of Remembrance, et cetera, uh, like two weeks ago when I was in Alexandria. And Courtney's mom actually organizes the whole thing. Um, but I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that one day soon we'll get, you know, we'll be able to do something. Um, how should I say it? Something. Uh, uh, I'm, you know what? I'm hoping this case is going to be solved. One day soon, and then we'll, we'll certainly do something big. Oh, right? yeah. And, and, and you better believe there'll be coverage. But um, anyway, thanks for saying we're doing a good job. We appreciate you. And we're wearing – Jim's wearing his pink, and I'm wearing my red. That's right. And a lot of lifers posted that today, y'all, and we appreciate that y'all wearing it for Courtney. All right. That's another question. Well, I need to read this. Karen uh, Lieber says, the timeline is my main confusion. I want much more info about those 4 a.m. calls. What proof do we have that the PO, the person of interest, really made those calls except the unreliable word of Detective Green? Can we get info on the location? Can we find out whose numbers were called? Do we think the person of interest and Courtney were together at 4 a.m. Was the phone found in Courtney's house? How can you get a DNA test at cigarette butts, beer cans, dominoes, et cetera, assuming, assuming they still have them without links to the PD? I think we're pretty much already covered all that, y'all. Um, the, the phone, you're right. With, uh, Detective Green is the one that said the person of interest had the phone. So uh, other than that, you know, I'm sure they're going to be looking into it in the DNA stuff. Uh, if, if that, if I don't want to say that, cause I mean, somebody go put dominoes and cigarette butts or whatever in Dr. Pepper cans and evidence now, but the, um, if that stuff is there, I'd be a fucking monkey's uncle. I'm just going to say that after 15 years, if you, if you don't tell the, the lead detective on the case that you have it, then I don't see why in the hell you turn in evidence. I pray it's there. I really do. I pray they took a videotape of that crime scene when they worked I it. And I pray that's there. And I pray that anybody that had ill will or negligence or whatever you want to call it that doesn't have access to destroy it. But 
we've gotten some information that is oh, yeah. probably otherwise. Absolutely. But somebody's going to have to answer We got for some it. juice. Yo. Yeah. We have no idea. Yeah. Um, Tori writes on here, uh, if we could get Google on board, would you consider selling your voice? Well, you know, Tori, I'm so glad that you mentioned that about my voice today. Um, <laughs> just kidding. What did you sell your voice to Google? The, um, I don't know. I'm kind of keep it on. <laughs> uh, like the Siri type thing. It'd be great if you were on like a GPS and you <laughs> mass your turn. Your sugar's turning into shit. That's funny. Turn around. That's funny. They're, they're, uh, they're like a little bitch. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll sell my voice to Google if Jim does a, a workout video. <laughs> and we can split the uh, There you go. That's <laughs> right. great. Great question. Thank you, sweetie. Um, all right. Whatever have um, I agree, not, Julie. I got to answer. I'm not going to answer that one. Green doesn't deserve to be called a detective. We're spot on. I think the only thing he's ever solved is where's Waldo on a, on a life cereal box. Because he sure doesn't know what the right. hell he's doing in this one. Yeah. A lot of these y'all are, are, I'm reading, scrolling through, I'm reading for the first time, and it's the same things we've already answered. Um, yeah, about how we'll push it forward if green's dirty and stuff like that. And or of course, we're going to, we, we're not saying he is or he isn't, but you know, whatever. The, we're not giving our work up to somebody that's not going to do the job. How about I answer it like that? Um, some of these I just can't answer. Some of them are sensitive in nature, so it's not that we, I mean, trust me, at, one, at some point we'd love to be able to answer everything, but right now there's a lot of information, a lot of questions that have come in that are just super one, sensitive, so you guys are thinking on the right on the right path, but uh, yeah, one day we, we will confirm it. be able to answer everything. And we'll Amy, able- those, those questions are good, but they're pretty close. Okay. This one says it was mentioned there was no trauma to the victim's body. This means she was not sexually assaulted despite the lack of clothing position of legs. Um, no evidence. You're right. No evidence of her being sexually assaulted. The lack of clothing and position of legs. There's a couple of different theories on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and from degrading her uh, for shock value to hurt the family, which certainly it does every day to leaving messages to other people or whatever, but can't really speculate it. Uh, but I can tell you that the autopsy says she was not sexually assaulted. Avery Thiel says, is Cedric Green now APD's deputy chief? If he is, Lord have mercy. <laughs> I agree, Avery. Yeah, we but agree. He, we think, won't speak to his current position. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, man. Um, Angela Stroud since her case is open back up, who is handling it? Is it still with APD only or as our PSO officially taking it over? All I can tell you about those two, uh, Angel is that we know on our PSO website, that her case was taken from being listed as cold to active current investigation. So I would assume that our PSO is doing something since they moved to that position. But I, I can, I can tell you that the, they're not, well, I can't tell you that. At the end of the day, there's three people working on it. Woody, myself and detective Rabelais that you can guarantee anything outside of that. No it, clue. Yeah. Except for what we do with it. And, there. Uh, oh yeah. And we can't tell you about that. So, um, when is Friday? When in, when Friday is the hotline ep- hotline episode, Elizabeth would be as soon as I can get home and get my wife to put it on the um, lips and and great great blah blah blah. Um, all right, Melissa Love, Woody and Jim, what advice would you give a young person aspiring to be in law enforcement during this time of distrust against law enforcement officers? Shit. Mm. It's a good question. Uh, you know, I think if you if you believe in something and you have it in your heart, you go for it. And, you know, you go into it with the idea of being able to, to help your community. I mean, that's what 
people get into this for. Maybe you have a tremendous idea and a tremendous way to connect the community together. Um, you know, cause that's, that's what it's all about. I think there's a, there's a distrust, but the distrust comes from, uh, misinformation. And, you know, I just think it's critically important. And I just speak to that. I just, I just think it's critically important that law enforcement goes to those areas that are, uh, underprivileged, so to speak, and build relationships. You don't have to go in there to arrest people, but you can most certainly go in there and talk to people. They're still human beings. And I think you build the trust that way. And that's, I mean, that's what it's all about. It's community oriented police. That's policing. how we used to do it. Mm-hmm. We, we knew I, uh, I would get out. I mean, I'm talking about in uniform patrol, and then the detectives also, but I would get out, uh, in certain problem areas mm-hmm. and literally get out. If they had a, a bonfire going, uh, uh, hanging around the trash bear, what I get out and go, go hang out and talk. Absolutely. To them. They knew that I wasn't going to do now. I probably arrested half of them. Sometimes when you <laughs> get out to go walk up, half of them take off running you know, and that's okay too. But the, they knew I wasn't going to harass them for uh, there's, no reason. There's, there's two, uh, I'll, I'll keep it, I'll keep it short. Um, to answer your question, finalize it. If you believe it in your heart and you, and you feel that, something you want to do, you absolutely go for it and you fulfill those dreams and you come up with a way to inspire others to, to do what you do and find that missing link and bring the community together. Two stories real quick on what I was talking about earlier. Um, when it comes to, you know, policing up your community, but treating people fairly and right. I used to patrol in a really bad area and I would go in there and, um, I would always, I don't know, I like to eat, so it is what it is. But I knew if I was going to go through there, I knew this one guy was always working outside and he was always busting his butt. So I used to bring cheeseburgers. And uh, I would literally just pull up and he and I would eat a cheeseburger too and just talk. We didn't talk right. anything at all about my job whatsoever or his. We just had conversations. Right. And every time I went rolling through there, he'd wave to me, I'd wave to him, I'd say hello, and we built a relationship. Well, sure enough, one day there was a really bad crime that happened. Who do you think gave me the information? Because he trusted me. That's right. Where you don't typically get information in there, but he believed in me. He knew I would do it right. And I did. And that's what it's all about. You know, um, another guy that I dealt with all the time would always run from other law enforcement. He probably ran from you one sometime or another. He always had owed back child support. And it, and it wasn't that he didn't make the efforts. He had to work jobs to for cash. He would pay what he could. So if he owed 500, but could only pay 300, he'd pay his 300. But now it's two hundred dollars on the whole, and so eventually a warrant would get cut for him, and you know he'd have to go to jail. Well, I used to talk to him like a human being all the time. So when he saw me come through, and he knew he didn't run from me, he literally was like, "Mr. Jim, I really I, another one. I got to go back again." So, yeah, you know, and and he'd let me put the handcuffs on him. Didn't fight. Didn't resist. We talked the whole way there. The guy would get out. He'd bust his butt to try to get caught up on that child support again. Um, you know, it's just an unfortunate situation for him, but he didn't run. He didn't fight. Right. It's all about building that trust and building that relationship. Yeah, and and I, I've had people um, from the uniform patrol days when they had murders down in certain areas. One time we actually arrested the wrong guy uh, off eyewitness testimony. And another one, the people who I was cool with, and I'd arrest him for it, but mm-hmm. I treat him professional. We were cool. Most people. Most of the people I arrest and take to jail, by the time I get done booking them, they tell me thank you. And we're shaking mm-hmm. hands, right? I mean, you don't have to uh, beat on everybody. The, um, but anyway, we got a call in from a guy that I arrested. And he said, hey, he, he, they used to call me the wolf on the street. And he said, wolf, you need to come down here. I need to talk to you. And uh, so I went down and he said, hey, you got the wrong dude. He said, you need to go to talk to this guy because he's been crying the whole time since it happened, et cetera. And he was right. And brought him in for a polygraph and got the confession and we had, we had to let the other guy go. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's good and bad in every profession, y'all. Young guys out there, I don't know how the hell you do it. The difference between what uh, today and back then is everybody has a camera nowadays. And, and like Jim said, it's – the videos that come out of the beatings and stuff like that, they're, they're a lot of the time they're cut down and you don't get to see the whole, the whole thing that. Yeah. You don't get to see the five, six minutes before I, it. I get called. I'm a, I'm certified as an expert witness in federal court and law enforcement matters. And I've been called in on several of these national wide cases where 
the police allegedly used too much force, et cetera. And, and, you know, if they don't have the whole video, they just want to show me the tech. I won't even, I won't even go. I don't care how much money they pay me. I want to see the whole thing. And, but I mean, you know, it's an honorable profession. And you really have to have some balls to do it nowadays. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's unfortunate the culture is the way that it is, but it's, people it's that because it. the media portrays it that way. Follow your dreams. So you got any questions on there? I'm um, on there's one here for you. Uh, let's see. How did you end up on Courtney's case? Like someone told um, Courtney's mom about y'all. The, I had a, um, a friend through Facebook a couple of years ago, and she knew that I retired from law enforcement. She knew about my career, and she's actually a family member and um, of Courtney's. And she told Miss Stephanie about me the, uh, a couple of years ago, and, and Miss Stephanie called, and we talked about it. And I said, you know what? Next time I'm swinging through Alexandria, I'll stop by and read the case file or get the case file and read it. And that's when she went in and told uh, Detective Isles that she was going to bring me in on the case, and they talked her out of it. And that's sh- shortly thereafter the the blood allegedly was retested, whatever. The second toxicology and all that comes out. But that's how uh, um, a family friend, uh, a relative of Courtney's and Stephanie's, had reached out to me and told me about the case, and then she put me in touch with Miss Stephanie. <laughs> uh, there's one for me, Jim. I want to know your biggest what the fuck moment on the streets, like when you questioned if your job was really worth it. Um, lumber slumber. I'll just leave it at that. I mean, that's just one of those that's where you're like, what? Shit. Honestly, though, on the street, I've come across so many different things. Um, <laughs> I've had some people try to stab me. I've had a guy on a traffic stop go to pull a gun out of his uh, out of his sweater. Um, which I didn't even realize that until after. Uh, so I made a traffic stop this one time and there was a bunch of robberies that were going on at night at the convenience stores. Um, not in our area, but a little bit more west of us there in the Baton Rouge city limits. And uh, I stopped this car. It came out of the bad area. Um, and it was just one of those moments where you start talking to the driver who was like, literally the guy was like six, six, um, And the hair in the back of your neck stands up because the radios weren't working too well at that point. Nobody was coming to back me up on that. And the conversation wasn't going well. I mean, I just, I just knew it was going to go south very quickly and the strengths are in numbers. And sometimes in law enforcement, you know, you feel like you can handle everything, but you got to be smart. And that was just one of those times where I just, you know, that the traffic stop wasn't necessarily worth it. And so I gave him his information back and immediately Try calling other people to like, hey, come over here. We know something's with this. I just knew it. And uh, so I rewound my tape that I had inside my car. And right at the time I was handing him his driver's license back, the passenger got out, um, literally pulled a gun out of his uh, front sweater pocket, pulled it out, started coming down with it like this, saw that I was giving the driver's license back, pulled it back, stuffed it back into a sweater, and they took off the Baton Rouge and they ended up being the robbery suspects. To Baton Rouge, uh, we had, we called everybody out on that one, and uh, they got caught and linked them to numerous um, robberies that were going out at night at convenience stores, and that's where they were headed. Yeah. So talk about an oh shit moment. Right. Yeah. Lots of those. Too many to remember, honestly. The um, but y'all back to Corny's case real quick. We are way way involved mm-hmm. I can't say anymore and you better believe we're coming and you better believe we're not putting in all this hard work and effort and time away from our families and everything else to give it up to somebody that's not going to take care of it okay and that's all we can say about that and when we do that or if that's been done already or whatever, those people have to have time to do their due diligence and catch up Mm -hmm. and work it. And it's just the way that it is. So, but you know, keep the tips coming in, uh, the calls, the support shared outside the page 
And, you know, again, patron members, thank you so much. And thank uh, you very much. Any supporters. Uh, we love all y'all. And, and, and I, I think one of the things, uh, I'm not even go back in that patron is necessary. Y'all it's absolutely necessary to, I mean, not even take the fur, a tenth of the cost of what we got going on. All right. But it's, it certainly helps and we appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. Keep, keep on sending in your information. Keep sharing Courtney's story. Um, keep doing everything that you're doing, but we love and appreciate all the support and the wonderful message we get. And, uh, we're going to keep working our butts off. You can guarantee that. And we're going to, we're going to find the answers. Uh, a lot of stuff's been uncovered at this point. And when I said it, it's, it's all, it's an inferno right now from what it was just a few weeks ago. Um, people are, are, they're going to be feeling it real soon. Yeah. For real. So, um, y'all, this is time for the podcaster talk, I guess. If you would please go to iTunes, leave us a review. Um, Continue to like and share our real life, real crime friends, fans, and crew page has blown up. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, crazy. 800 new members yesterday or something. Or I, I don't know how. Crazy. Like, but we but, love it. So let's keep oh, it yeah, going. Yeah, you love it. Just, <laughs> that, 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 no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm doing the podcast thing now. So I'm, I'm trying to say, y'all, go to that page. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't been to my regular Facebook page in like a month and a half because all I do is go check the crew page because that's where it's all at. Even the regular real life real crime page, I think I may have been there once in a month because I'm going to the uh, crew page and I try mm-hmm. to answer. I try to answer every post that I can that y'all make or question that you answer, at least give you a thank you comment, et cetera. And I know Jim's doing the same thing. Uh, but y'all, that page has a, just a wealth of information and our viewers and, and the dream team moderators. Oh my God. Y'all know we love you. But if you're not a member of the page, and I know a lot of you aren't, even the patron members I've seen, um, a lot of them become patron, but they're not in the crew page. So I don't know how right. we're going to address that. Link other both to talk to y'all about it now. Go check it out. We have stuff like Karen Ortolano, who's, a, who's just like a, research genius post something I can. interesting about um, true crime every day. And then every, all the interaction uh, with the crew members and the lifers and stuff. If you, if you're not a member of the page, go join it and then ask other people to join it. Cause if you're not a member of the page, you're missing out. And then of course we have the Lanyap page, which it's up uh, in the hundreds now. And that's where, um, lifers can go to post stuff that's not directly related to the cases. Like we have everything from a cookbook going on to we swap beers and hot sauces. And, mm-hmm. uh, Dave McKinnon is a lifer. He, he put, um, it's hilarious. He is fun. <laughs> he, uh, he posts some videos and stuff on there. Like last night he put, he put on bad boys, right? But there's a, there's a place for that. And I think that <laughs> Dave understands it. And that's, that's what the Lanyap page for. Lanyap is a Cajun word meaning something extra free or bonus. So anything all your lifers have that you want to do outside that's not true crime related. Hey, you, if you, you've got something you make and you want to sell it or whatever, go put it on there. We don't, we don't care. That's your sure. page too. Absolutely. But, um, you're, you're a lifer. And we love you and we appreciate you. Um, so just continue to like us and share us and, yep. and support where you can and continue to call the hotline. I don't have the number. I know it's on the website. The, um, but that's it. I, I guess we're going to wrap it up with this. Yeah. Well, hey, like we appreciate you very much. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thank you for all the tips and all the information. Stay tuned. It's yeah. getting hot. It's getting hot. It's getting hot. <laughs> the, uh, um, Bring y'all some some good info next week, hopefully. Yeah. Oh man. Some yeah. updates. They, um, love and appreciate each and every one of y'all. And I'm Woody Overton. I'm Jim Rathman. And it's been a pleasure. Ne- next time or ever, don't let us catch you down on murder by you. Peace. Peace. Targeted. True crime, domestic violence. We tell stories of those who were targeted by domestic abuse, 
and investigate cases of family violence, using academic research to interpret the events. As a college professor, I think we need to stop making family violence a secret. Let's use our stories to help, heal, and provoke change. Season three features the case of Josh Osborne, which is a story of abuse. When he woke up, she was abusing him. When he went to sleep, she was abusing him. So his abuse was nonstop. It didn't matter what he did, yeah. it was nonstop. But it is also a story of hope. Targeted, true crime, domestic violence. Listen to us for free on all of your favorite podcatchers. Peace, my friends. Peace. to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney prior to and during questioning. If you can't afford one, the court will point one for you. You understand your rights? It is Ryan Seacrest. There's something so thrilling about playing Chumba Casino. Maybe it's the simple reminder that with a little luck, anything is possible. ChumbaCasino.com has hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new game releases each week. Play for free anytime, anywhere for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. Sponsored by Chumba Casino. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply.